May it please the Court, good morning. Michael Mims on behalf of Defendant Appellant Waste Connections Bayou, Inc. I would like to reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal. We are asking this Court to reverse the District Court and enter a full judgment in favor of Defendant. This appeal presents multiple issues, but the most glaring question is when two parties to a services contract both testify that they never agreed to a rate increase, they had discussions only, can a reasonable jury conclude, we don't really care what the testimony showed, we think there was an oral contract to a rate increase? Well, uh, would the absence of a price in a contract under Louisiana law defeat the contract, or could the law provide a, uh, a price? It could provide a price if there is a missing price. Here there was not a missing price because there... Well, if they didn't agree to a price, then is there not a missing price? They agreed that they would continue their current relationship, which had been that Waste Connections was a general contractor paying its subcontractor $165 per haul. So are you saying they agreed to continue the 165 or are you saying they didn't agree? We are saying that they agreed to pay Metro $165 per haul for the hauls that were actually performed by Metro as part of an at-will arrangement. Okay. So you're saying they agreed to that in the new contract? If there was a new contract, at most, it was an at-will contract. Well, there's two, there's two questions, right? There could be a new contract with a missing price, or there could just be no new contract. Yes, Your Honor. We would submit there was no missing price because the party's conduct for from 2014 through September of 2020 showed that they were both operating at this 165 price. In fact, Metro was the one submitting invoices to Waste Connections at $165. Fair enough. That sounds like, that sounds like an argument for, yes, a new contract and at the same price. Correct. Uh, and the key admission from Metro here, their CEO, Jimmy Woods, was, I don't think we ever obviously had an agreement on a rate increase. The testimony below was very consistent that Metro asked for a new contract. They asked that a rate increase be part of that new contract. Waste Connection said, we're working on it, we're passing it up the chain, that never got a new contract. In the meantime, the parties agreed, we'll continue our current relationship. Well, what the district court said was the evidence suggested that what Waste Connections was doing was basically giving them the hand, not giving them a new contract, and then just keeping the profits for themselves. That Waste, uh, I guess, um, I'm going to get confused. Metro Services was asking for the new rate, and, and there's a CPI in the, well, I thought, the original contract, right? Correct. So the district court, in, in assessing the post-trial motions, basically assessed the evidence a little bit differently. And, and Judge Wilson, that goes to the tactical decisions at trial that Metro made. They made the tactical decision to present this as a breach of contract case with breach of contract damages. What you're referencing, this idea that Waste Connections was stringing them along, that they said a contract would come, but it never came. But well, they did say that. You're right, Your Honor. What was it, 10 years? You're right, Your Honor. How and that take to write up a contract, especially when you had a prior one? What those conversations could plausibly constitute would be a detrimental reliance claim. The problem for Metro here is they never presented any evidence of damages for detrimental reliance. Louisiana law states that the damages are different from breach of contract. For detrimental reliance, you actually have to show evidence of we incurred expenses based on this promise you made us. Here, for example, we spent a million dollars on new trash trucks because you told us a new contract was coming and that never happened. The record is completely devoid of any damages evidence of that sort. And so maybe they could have tried. There was, there was evidence in the record, the district court detailed it in the post-trial order, that uh, Metro Services needed a higher rate, that that was what was always contemplated, that I guess the renewal of the contract was at a higher rate from Jefferson Parish, right? Not, not exactly, Your Honor. I'm misreading the district court's the, uh, uh, order, I guess, it, not an opinion, at the end where, where she's, the court is grappling with the evidence on both counts. On this idea of a new rate, it is true that the parties were discussing a new rate and were discussing that that issue was being passed up the chain at Waste Connections. And the court, the court grappled with um, the very quote where, um, I guess, Metro Services um, said, yeah, we, there wasn't a, a new rate agreed to, or obviously we didn't reach agreement. 
And the district court dealt with that and said there was other evidence that there, the higher rate was contemplated. In other words, the district court found that there was evidence for the jury to say, yeah, it was supposed to be the 225. What the district court uh, said in the order was, yeah, Metro said we ne they never agreed to a new rate, but that doesn't necessarily mean the jury couldn't have concluded that, in fact, they did. We disagree with that. But to Judge Duncan's point, though, under Louisiana law, can't the jury fill in the price if the price is missing? The standard here, and we're dealing with an appeal of a denial of a motion for judgment of matter of law, is were the jury's findings supported by substantial evidence? And I think we view the evidence most favorably to the verdict, right? You are to look to see whether there's substantial evidence, which means could two people have, could two reasonable people have differing view, conclusions as to the factual basis? I think one thing that's the important. To this question is yes. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. And, and I do want to build on that. I think the important part here is you're going to hear from Metro all about the credibility disputes that the jury resolved, and this court should not step in to infringe on those credibility determinations. There is not actually a factual dispute about what the parties were discussing, what communications were exchanged between the parties. The record is consistent from both sides. Metro asked for a new contract. Waste Connection said we're working on it. Waste Connection said, in the meantime, let's continue. Let's continue the relationship we had. Yes, Your Honor. That relationship wasn't an at-will employment, right, or engagement. It wasn't it for a term with notice of, provision, notice of so, termination so provisions, all those things? What, what you're hitting on is whether let's continue means let's adopt the terms of the 2009 written subcontract. I thought it was let's continue with our current relationship or something to that effect. That, that, that was, that's correct, Your Honor. You can't have that if it means, well, 165 and, and then disclaim it when it means not terminable at will for a, per, a, a particular term, definite term, all those kinds of things. In other words, if it's current relationship, how do you square that? You don't get to pick and choose the, the terms waste connections likes well, in the and, current relationship. And, and we, we would also submit that Metro doesn't get to say, well, they said continue the current relationship, except we wanted a new price. And Did we the prior wanted. contract have a CPI adjustment provision? Excuse me, Your Honor? Did the, con the contract that existed prior to the, the renewal, did it have a CPI adjustment provision, like a rate adjustment? The 2009 written subcontract provided for a rate of 165 plus CPI adjustments. That's correct, Your Was Honor. the CPI ever given? No, Your Honor, it was never given. Uh, is there evidence in the record as to whether 225 is a market rate? There is evidence to that effect. There was contrasting evidence that 225 uh, was based off of a different job that had different circumstances. Again, this goes back to what we discussed earlier of you don't get to the question of supplying a market rate unless there's a missing price. And based on the conduct of the parties over many years, there was not a missing price here. Understand. Under Louisiana law, in order for plaintiffs to prove an oral contract, they need the testimony of at least one witness and corroborating evidence. Now, the testimony from Metro was that Jimmy Woods felt like there should be a new duration for this new alleged oral agreement, and he felt like they deserved a new rate. But he never testified that anyone from Waste Connection said, we're agreeing to a new rate, or we're agreeing to a new duration. So we have to look at what the corroborating circumstances were, and we can look to the writings, the conversations, and the conduct of the party. For the writings between the parties, there was no written agreement for the post-2013 relationship. Metro has pointed to emails from Waste Connection saying, we will continue our current relationship. On the oral representations, they've pointed to Waste Connection saying, we'll, we'll work on that new contract. In the meantime, we'll continue our current relationship. And in terms of the conduct, when you look at the conduct from 2014 through 2018, from November of 2018, Metro is submitting invoices to Waste Connections with a price of 165. Waste Connections pays that rate. Metro continues to do the work, continues to send additional invoices at 165. It's not until November of 2018 that Metro submits its first invoice for 225. Waste Connections immediately rejects that rate, and then the parties for two more years continue to operate under this rate of 165. So the conduct certainly does not corroborate that they ever agreed to a new price or a new duration. 
the the conduct also shows that metro asked three dozen times for a new contract and each time waste connection said we're working on it if anything that corroborates that metro knew there wasn't a new contract yet in the meantime they continued to work under that 165 uh, uh, that 165 rate i know you there's a separate part that i hope you get to about damages evidence uh, exclusion of an expert on Cor correct your honor so I, I think one of the difficult questions in this case is given that the parties agreed that there was never an agreement on that new price that's reason enough for this court to conclude there's a defect in the verdict below the harder question is what should this court do about it we see three options the first would be a full reversal entry of a judgment of matter of law in favor of defendants finding that there was no contractual agreement post 2013 other than to pay metro 165 for the jobs that they actually did a second option would be a new trial but a narrow one on the issue of was there any contractual agreement post 2013 but the court holding judgment in favor of defendants that there was never an agreement on a new price and there was never an agreement on a new duration for that 2013 to end of 2023 period uh, the record below is a robust one, and we've mentioned that there is not actually factual disputes about the communications. It's just a question of did those communications rise to the level of an oral agreement. And so we do think the court could enter judgment on those two issues, but issue a new trial on the narrow question of was there any agreement, such as was it 165 plus CPI for that uh, at-will period after 2013. The final uh, option would be to grant a new trial on the evidentiary issues, to, to hold that the, there were evidentiary, evidentiary errors below, grant a whole new trial. The errors below that we, you, you're asking about are the, the damages. Uh, Metro was awarded damages for about four years of future lost profits. That was based off of their experts' calculations of what the average amount of hauls that they had done historically. Waste Connections attempted to cross-examine both the plaintiff and the plaintiff's experts on whether they were actually equipped to do that number of hauls going forward because there was well-publicized manpower and equipment shortages that Metro was having. The district court wouldn't allow it. The district court thought it was prejudicial. It clearly goes to damages and the defendant's right and to- you, you believe you had evidence that shows, well, they couldn't have done that number of hauls, therefore, the damages should have been less. Correct. At least the jury should have had that before. We, that, that's, that's the evidence that we had, and we were not allowed to explore that issue. There, there is a proffer from defendants' witnesses showing Metro could not keep up with the work, and we had ask, to step in. I was going to ask about a proffer that's in the record, so we can look at the evidence. That, that, that is in the record. Um, that, I'll get that cite to you later, but yeah, there, the proffer is in the record. What is not in the record, because Waste Connections was not allowed to put it in the record, is the cross-examination of plaintiff. Mm -hmm. You were having manpower shortages in 2020. Isn't that right? You were having trouble keeping up with your work in 2020. Isn't that right? We were not allowed to ask those questions, uh, and they clearly go to damages. The other evidentiary issue was the speculation over... Let me ask you this. Were both sides allowed to put in expert evidence as to damages? Keep keeping to one side this excluded uh, the, the testimony. Did you both have experts? They were, bo they were both damages experts. Uh, the, the, the objection is that plaintiff's damages experts, it essentially went unrebutted because we were not allowed to probe into whether that number was. But you had your own expert? Yes, Your Honor, we did. I do want to hit on this issue of the same terms and conditions email because that was another evidentiary issue that really tainted this trial for the defendants. When we talk about corroborating evidence, one of the chief pieces of corroborating evidence that Metro tried to rely on is, well, Waste Connection said same terms and conditions as before will apply. That was never communicated to Metro. There is nothing in the record showing that that email was ever sent to Metro. Metro never testified that they were ever told that. The district court did allow rank speculation from a third party who was not part of that email to say, yeah, I think that was probably forwarded to Metro based on the party's past relationship. He did not have uh, personal knowledge of that. We timely objected, the district court overruled it, and then Metro spent their entire closing argument saying, 
you heard Waste Connections told them same terms and conditions apply. It never happened. It's not in the record below. And so that's another basis for reversal. Thank you, Counsel. You have time for rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Zimmer. May it please the court, Charles Zimmer, on behalf of Metro Service Group. Um, I'm going to go off script here and just address the. Well, points. so how was there? How was the jury rational in finding a contract for 225 when the president of Metro Services said we can never agree on a price? Oh, very easily, actually. Um, if you look at the definition um, of what is needed to form that contract. Uh, Louisiana Civil Code Article 1846 states that when a writing is not required by law, a contract not reduced to writing for a price or in the absence of price for a value not in excess of $500 on an on and on you can form a contract. And that flows a long line of case law where the, especially in, in something like an oral contract where it's always going to be a fight. If you're in court about an oral contract, somebody doesn't agree that there was a contract. You have a written contract. Right. So the, the jury here was presented with a lot of evidence, and it's, uh, you know, it's great to go, oh, he said there was no agreement. He's being perfectly honest. They never said, Jimmy, 225 it is. So here's what we presented and what the jury agreed with. They came to Jimmy Woods and said, you know, this was before he knew about the CPI issue. So they come to him in 2013, like, look, we got to get this contract. We have a chance for a no-bid 10-year contract. As the district court raised, that raises its own problems because you're really not supposed to be able to do that. But somehow they did. Let's assume that that was all in the up and up, okay? Um, so, but they say, look, we need you. So they get into the uh, agreement, and Jimmy says, look, I'm at 165 from 2009. This is not profitable for me. I need a new rate. And they're like, Jimmy, you're, we're together. We're on it. We're on it. We're on it. We're on it. We're but doing it. But you build the old rate for, what, yeah. four years? Yeah. In that four, correct. And in that four-year period, how many emails and discussions do we have him saying, where's the new contract? And they're like, oh, man, yep. It's, but, it's, you build the, but you build the old rate for four years. You don't is have. There, is there any evidence they, that they tried to build the 225 any time during that 2014 to 2018? 2018, they started building it. November of 2018. I'm talking about prior to that. Prior to that, they did not build. Four no. years. They, four years, they kept doing it because that was what they had. Um, but there's nothing in the record that they were asking for it other than they were back and forth about where's our contract. Correct. Any, any evidence during that four-year period about the rate in particular? Not the rate in particular, although the testimony is very clear. Most of this was happening by telephone, that this was going back and forth by telephone. The emails were the rarity, not the, the norm, but these two older gentlemen. Um, so when they show up with 225 at the end, it ratifies what they had said from the beginning and that there were ongoing conversations the whole time. And when you see the emails continually popping up, it says, look, he's again asking. It's never like, hey, I got this random thing. And there's always a response, oh yeah, we'll get to it. And I, I wanna, there's a couple of things that counsel said that I think are very important. Um, as he predicted, yes, I am talking about credibility because that is what we're here for. He said, we're gonna use a current relationship and that's an at-will contract. That's fundamentally wrong. Those two things do not go together. The current relationship, which is a stipulated fact before trial. So this was not even a, a fight, okay? the stipulated fact that we will use the current relationship. That happened in 2013. 2013, you have a binding contract. And I went through extensively with Mr. Uh, Tom uh, 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 Martin. What is your relationship? They pick up some trash, we pay them. Okay, where do they dump it? Well, wherever the contract says. Well, you have to have insurance for your subs, right? Well, how do they know what insurance to get? Well, I mean, that's what the contract says. Uh, if they dump it in your front yard, is that okay? Because there's no contract, right? How could they be in violation of a contract? No, no, no. Eventually, he's like, well, I mean, yes, the terms of the contract, yeah. This is just, frankly, nonsense. 165, let's say you are applying the terms of this contract. It's not 165 anymore. They admit in the stipulated facts, yeah, we collected the CPI increase. Their rate was 187 by that point just applying the, the, the CPI increase. 
So if you're going to say legitimately and honestly to this court, we wanted to do the same terms and conditions as December 31st, 2013, well, 165 is not that. 165 is you going, they still don't know about the CPI. That's what's going on. And at trial— Why, why didn't Metro Services bill it? Sorry? Why didn't they bill it? At the 225? 187, 225. Anything other than 165. That's a question that they paid, you know, the damages for. How come they didn't update their stuff? And his testimony was that they just trusted that it was going to get fixed and they didn't want to destroy the relationship. Where's any evidence of that belief that it's going to get fixed? That's throughout his, I mean, and the court even pointed out at some point, she pulled us at sidebar and said, well, he's clearly, I, y'all didn't tell me before that they were worried they were going to take the contract from him if they pushed back. And he's clearly has testified that now they were worried that if they pushed back, they were going to lose this contract. So that's all. So part it would get fixed as sort of the back and forth about where's our contract. We're getting it to you. That, that Right. And as a small company in this $213 million, you know, big piece that you don't really have the power to just go, hey, man, we're not picking stuff up. They'd be like, good, because guess what? <laughs> Here's our internal emails that say we're hoping we can take this from you. You know, they, they pushed to get the contract using their relationships. Immediately, and it's at Exhibit uh, uh, 14, internally, Waste Connections is saying, you know what? We really need to get rid of Metro. They don't have a contract and we can take this and we can get $120,000 a month in profit. So that was as soon as they started this relationship. Internally, they're saying, well, how do we get it from them? And you have the, the two border law, uh, not related, but two border law uh, witnesses in Waste Connections going, that's a bad idea. We got this contract, a lot of because of their relationships. They're a local small business. Don't go and try and take them for this little bit of profit. And they say that, oh, well, that died on the vine. Don't worry about it. It all fits exactly the credibility issue that's going on. That They knew they had them. They had tricked them into getting them. They're telling the parish, sworn affidavits every month to get paid, Metro is our subcontractor. Not going, well, they're not really a subcontractor, but if they show up, we're going to give them 165 bucks and no CPI increases. We don't know if they have insurance. We don't know any of this stuff. You know, but hey, they're still showing up, so we're still going to do it. And they shouldn't have, frankly. So I can understand, the there was a written contract for a term uh, when was that term supposed to end? It ended with the contract, with, with the original prime contract. When, when uh, Waste, um, uh, connection Waste Connections gets the new, the new one, um, then the, the new contract going forward, your theory is it's an oral contract, no longer a written contract, not an amendment of the original contract because that would have been forbidden. Correct, and that also cures uh, the only error, well, you know, an error I think of the trial court, the trial court in her uh, Rule uh, 50B ruling said that you couldn't, this whole issue about applying the price, you couldn't do because they were actually had a price and that that case law doesn't apply to changing a price. And for that exact point, I think that was actually erroneous because it was, it's actually a stipulated fact. They did not amend the contract. This well, is a new have contract. They the contract orally, right? They could not have amended orally, yeah. no. It, there was a provision in the contract that said it has to be in writing. Right. So. Here, it, they, they approach it as if it's so hard to comprehend what we're talking about. And it was one of the reasons in closing we just showed the jury a copy of the original contract where it has multiple references to incorporated by reference. Just to let them see that it's not unusual for contracting parties to say, look, we have this little simple thing. We're going to incorporate this bigger thing over here so we all know what it is without restating it all. So the idea that you can't do that orally to go, look, we're going to redo that same contract, but we're going to change the, update the rates. is not complicated. It's not hard to grasp. And it, and it, it certainly cures all of the problems that would occur of, well, what do we do with all these details that aren't there? Last question about that is uh, you build 165, as we've discussed, for a certain number of years. Yes, sir. You're not seeking damages for those years, right? The damages are for the three years, which was the prescriptive period for the open account. Um, which goes back to, oh, forgive me the date, um, but yes, it, all, of the, all of the period was during the time of the 225 requested period, that period before they lost. Um, yeah, they're not getting 225 then. Right, right, they were getting 165, they were, they, were, they were invoicing for 225, and then the future damage issues were at 225. Um, the, uh, I also wanted to, the council mentioned multiple times that, you know, we're passing it up the chain, and he used the word meantime several times. Nowhere in the record is there a meantime. 
Jimmy, in the meantime, let's do this. Mr. Woods, we'll do this in the meantime. That is never, ever, ever said, which is important because that would be a flag that, well, all right, so something's, you know, we're in a different state right now. Never said that. And they didn't say it before, they didn't say it after. And, you know, my client should have stood up sooner and said, you know, we're not picking up trash next week. Um, but that would have then led to a termination under the contract. So they didn't have a lot of good options. And uh, unfortunately, they waited and they lost millions of dollars because of it, because they just gave up all of the CPI increases and all of those underpayments for the period that was before three years from the date of filing of the suit. The debt, the, there's this claim that there was a, it's a breach of contract case, not a detrimental reliance case. Um, and the trial court pointed that out when they made the objection below that that was frankly nonsense. And the response from counsel was, well, that's what that's captioned. Like, right, yeah, it's captioned breach of contract, but we actually had a section for claims that, that stated, you know, other claims. So uh, that one, I think, holds no water. Um, the expenses for the detrimental reliance proof, the expenses do have to be proven. Here you have an easy way to prove it because you have another rate to replace it. So instead of going through the analysis of what is your normal profit margin expenses and all that stuff, it's a lot easier to go in and say, well, what is the, the rate you were supposed to get? What's the market rate versus your actual rate? So you cure that math without having to go through the analysis of it, uh, of all the details. On the evidentiary issues, this is a, uh, let's call it a red herring, I think would be giving it too much credit. The evidentiary issues were stemming from a motion in limine actually filed by Waste Connections, not by my client, Metro. So they proffered the evidence, and I would, I would ask you to look. Damages yes, well, and it, it's not just the expert. It's everything about the proffered evidence. So they say they were precluded from putting this evidence on, so they proffered it. The proffered evidence has nothing to do with an inability to do the work. They asked my client about did you have problems doing the work? And it's at uh, page 2448 um, of the record where he asked Mr. Woods, you know, didn't you, did you have difficulty hauling in 2020? He's like, no, I wouldn't say, say that. He said, well, didn't the number go down? He says, yeah, we started cutting back when we realized we weren't getting paid. So th that, this whole but for a world, okay, if you're gonna say that we could not have done the work, you have to assume that is in the but for a world where they're getting paid the right rate. Was there testimony, any other evidence to the contrary from another source that, if, that, that they were struggling to uh, do the work? There's, there's one piece of proffered evidence where an internal Waste Connections email says, oh, we had to cover for Metro, they're not picking up, and again, that in that time period that the email's in, it fixed with what my client is saying. It's like, yeah, at the end of this relationship, after we're billing 225 and you're not paying it and this thing is really starting to fall apart, yeah, we're not allocating resources to an unprofitable project anymore, which again, fit with what Waste Connections wanted because they wanted the work the whole time. Um, and so that's the only position, one. position that doesn't go to damages? The jury could certainly look at it. You know, I, I wouldn't, we didn't move to strike the, that evidence. So let's say the jury saw one internal email going, we have one example, or let's say one week, let's say one month of Metro not picking up all the time they're supposed to. The rest of the evidence is all about complaints. And that's what the judge actually struck. She made very clear pre-trial, and it's on the record. You can talk about their inability to perform. You can ask those questions. All of the evidence you're trying to put in is saying they did bad work. And the judge correctly said that's irrelevant because there's only two theories. If there's no contract, as you proclaim on one hand, you could fire them because it's Tuesday. So it doesn't matter if they're doing good or bad work, you could fire them that they have no damages. So what we're actually reviewing is an evidentiary ruling for abuse of discretion. I mean, the, the district court said, I'm not putting this in, it's unfairly prejudicial. She said that it was irrelevant and potentially prejudicial to both sides because it meant that all the evidence came in, ours and theirs. Ours was monthly 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 fines from the city against waste connections for bad work. Now they're gonna look at Metro and go, oh, well, your, your work's not good enough. Well, hold on, none of these say Metro. She didn't, want, she didn't want any of that in. She did not want any of that in because it did not go to their ability to haul. It went to the theory we were gonna fire them anyway. 
and as the court pointed out, you have a, if the contract applies, again, because that's the world you're in where termination is even relevant. So if you're trying to say I was going to fire them because they did bad work, well, you never gave them notice and a cure period. So that's, that doesn't make any sense. Why am I going to let you tell the jury they're doing bad work when you never actually tried to terminate them? And their witness on the proffer was, it was great because start going through this stuff and they have all these complaints. I'm like, well, this complaint about trash on the ground, does Metro pick up the trash off the ground? No, no, actually that's us. They just haul it. Well, this complaint about the, the guy at the front gate, is that a Metro guy? No, no, that's not. A, we go through all this. Most of it is not, a, mo, almost none of it is about Metro. Most of it is about waste connections at that facility. Metro's role there was just to grab the trucks and leave. In any event, we can see this, right? It's in the proffer? It is in the proffer, yes. And I, I would, uh, I think the proffer is, is, is strangely useful in this because it shows, one, that the judge was right in her evidentiary ruling that it wasn't relevant. At the same time, it destroys their argument that, well, if we'd have had this, we could have examined their expert differently. They examined the expert with all the evidence they had about the inability to do the work. And you know what the evidence was? Here's the history of halls. Would you agree it goes down? He's like, yes. It's like, did you take that into account? Yes, it's an average, so it's included in, the, in there. That's the end of their questioning. They go on, and the reason is because they've got nothing else. Their own expert presented no opinion about an alternative theory. Why? The expert's reports were done from discovery. It had nothing to do with the judge's ruling on the motion to eliminate. They had developed no evidence throughout discovery of an inability to do the work. At trial, the testimony was, no, we could do the work. We just stopped doing it when we realized we were never going to get paid. Now they come and say, oh, we were precluded from asking that question. It's simply not true. If you read the, the testimony, the statement that the judge stopped them from asking these questions is inaccurate. You read it, they ask the questions, and they stop. There's only one time where the judge stopped the uh, examination, and that was based on an objection where the question was, are you reasonably certain about your expert calculation of future damages? I objected that that gave the wrong impression because the case law said reasonable certainty is the same as a preponderance. But by using that term, which was not been explained to the jury yet, it would be confusing. That objection was withheld, I mean, upheld or sustained. Counsel then said, okay, moving on. The judge didn't tell counsel, you're not allowed to ask any questions about that. And it's specifically just the opposite instruction was given before trial where there was a lengthy discussion about the then recent motion in limine, what it meant, and what counsel was allowed to do. And the district court made very clear, you're allowed to attack their inability to do the work. I'm not letting you talk about them doing bad work. And that's where I think what happens on appeal, you get someone looking at it and saying, well, jury verdicts need to be protected, so let me find this sliver of argument. The problem is the testimony and the actual examination, the actual rulings don't line up with that argument. You know, it's a nice technicality, but getting to the meat underneath it, it's not there. Um, again, their expert presented no evidence for the jury to make a different opinion from. The jury was left with Metro's version of future damages or accept that there was no future damages. And was the jury entitled, were there two different scenarios presented through the expert's testimony? There were, there were, I guess, technically four scenarios if you count both sides' experts. Each expert gave two scenarios uh, depending on whether or not you use the 165 rate or you use the 225 rate so that the jury was allowed to say, is there an agreement to 225 or not? Um, the, the difference of the experts in that was that the, our experts used the uh, forward period all the way through the end, whereas theirs said the day we stop doing business with you is the day all your damages end. And the two experts actually complemented each other. You know, that they we're using the same theories, we use the same numbers, everything's the same except for what the assumption is, which of course is the providence of the jury to go, well, we're picking which assumption. The jury came back and said, you know, can we see these? We all agree that they could look at the numbers and they chose to use the scenario that corresponded with an agreement or detrimental reliance on the belief there was an agreement at the 225 rate all the way through the end, which was the maximum uh, damage period. And there was an error um, that came up and only pointed out because I didn't want the expert to eat it. The expert calculated it based on the date stated in the contract, which turned out to be 11 years. 
the actual contract says on the front is for ten years and by law it's supposed to be ten years so i didn't want to leave him hanging that he had done the calculation wrong he did it right based on what the contract said we all agreed that it should be limited to ten so they adjusted the jury verdict downwards and the issue finally about the letting one man potentially let's say he speculated that they saw this if you look at exhibits that were in the case which is anyway if you look at the exhibits you'll see that this was repeated so often and so frequently that one email or that one exchange had nothing to do with it's a stipulated fact that it was the same terms and conditions so to complain that they heard you know I mean the current relationship to go oh but if they heard terms and conditions that changes everything current relationship terms and conditions let's assume that he didn't hear that it wouldn't change anything thank you for your time thank you your honor we spent a lot of time talking about the evidentiary issues I'm going to give you just a couple brief record sites and then I think we should move on to what is the heart of the the issue here mr. Zimmer mentioned that the trial court didn't actually preclude us from presenting the manpower shortages issues I would just direct the court to page 2246 2500 2708 and then our proffer begins at 2724 at the conclusion of which the judge again said no I'm not going to allow that 2500 is specifically where we attempted to cross-examine Jimmy Woods you were having equipment and manpower shortages those would have continued into the future right we weren't allowed to touch that so that really demonstrates the issue on the damages what I think is the heart of this case and it goes to why this is an important case for businesses going forward and having certainty with their contracting going forward the court is faced with the question of when a subcontractor unilaterally believes that the parties agreed to a rate increase and agreed to an amended duration but the only corroborating evidence is the general contractor saying we will continue the existing relationship is that sufficient corroboration to warrant not just a continuance of the prior relationship but amendments to price and duration that the sub unilaterally desires the answer is no that's dictated by the Reed versus Willwood case Louisiana Supreme Court 2015 that's where the court said yes there was an oral agreement as to an employment contract but we have to look at the key terms and the key term there was duration and they said even though there was an oral agreement to an employment contract there was not sufficient corroboration on duration and therefore it was an at-will contract we're dealing with the same sort of situation here we have to look at whether there was corroborating circumstances not just to a relationship generally but to new price new duration Metro is essentially asking for this de minimis standard that well if there's corroboration that they were going to keep going then if we unilaterally say we understood that to mean the price we wanted and the duration we wanted then we've got corroboration that's not what Reed says and that's not what this court should hold I want to get back judge Wilson on this issue of current relationship that did that mean an at-will arrangement the way we get there is Louisiana law says if you've got a contract without a set duration or with a nonsensical duration then we supply at will the sort of ways connections contract with the parish of an unlimited duration so and that's what I'm getting to your 10 years it was not a 10-year duration so the 2008 prime contract that waste connections had with the parish was a five-year contract with a five-year option the 2009 subcontract agreement with Metro said this will track the term of the 2008 prime contract when that expires the subcontract expires now Metro would like for will continue our relationship to mean the new subcontract is going to track the duration of the 2014 prime contract that waste connections have but the secret to the sauce and the prime contract the 10-year prime contract no bid contract was continuing the relationship you had with Metro services right no your honor I would just no evidence about that about how we want to keep our relationship going and we feel like that's an important part of getting this deal that there's evidence that Metro's Metro helped waste connections get that contract there is evidence of that your honor but on this idea of a new duration 
that the new subcontract was going to have a 10 year duration that it was going to track the 2014 prime contract that waste connections had with the parish that is not supported by the record metro's own witnesses never said that's what waste connections told us that's not in the record you don't think a jury could rationally have come to that conclusion not based off of continue our current relationship was that what the uh, was argued to the jury what was argued to the jury is that the same terms and conditions would apply, that being the 2009 subcontract. But even if that were true, that the 2009 subcontract would apply going forward, the duration of that is tied to an old contract that's expired. So it's this ambiguous duration, and Louisiana law says we supply at will. This case has two sophisticated businesses that know there is a risk to doing business without a written contract. One of those risks is if you're a struggling subcontractor and you can't get the job done, the general contractor doesn't have to stick with you, especially when they owe duties to Jefferson Parish. Waste Connections moved on because Metro wasn't getting the job done and there was no contract in place. Thank you, counsel, for a well-argued case on both sides. Uh, the matter is under submission, and that uh, concludes the work of this panel this week, and we stand in. We're adjourned. <laughs>